And I think it's a good moment to, to start. I'm getting a signal from Arvin that everything is on the right track technically, uh, technical wise. So we can start our web debate. Welcome to all to our uh, December web debate, the last for uh, the year 2019. For those of you who follow regularly these, these, these debates, you know that we meet every first Tuesday of the month to discuss new and emerging issues of diplomacy and international relations. And we look at the skills that the next generation of diplomats and IR professionals need to, for their work and for their profession. These debates are organized by Diplo Foundation in the context of the International Forum of Diplomatic Training. I'm Marco Lotti, I'm project manager at Diplo Foundation at the Geneva office, and I have the pleasure to moderate the debate today. So for our December debate, we are meeting to discuss the topic of innovative teaching methodologies for diplomacy. And we will be looking specifically at digital tools for teaching diplomacy. In particular, with today's discussion, we will explore the digital tools that are currently exploit, ex, um, employed, the how and the why they are utilized, the challenges and the opportunities behind and associated with them. And we will also seek to address the best, best practices and lessons learned. So quite a lot of meat on the plate, I would say, for today. And ultimately, if I may say, we seek to generate an exchange discussion on these methodologies and ideally inspire those who work in the field. And that is uh, why I would like this debate to be as interactive as possible. For this debate, I'm joined by two experts that they're going to share their perspectives and reflections on digital tools for teaching diplomacy. So I'm joined by Professor Jaime de Aguinaga Garcia, Professor of Practice of International Development at the School of Global and Public Affairs at the IE University, and Dr. Katarina Hone, Senior Researcher and Lecturer at Diplo Foundation. Before we jump and we start the discussion, um, I would like to remind you that this is a web debate and I mean, whether it takes place online or not, it's still a debate. So it's a highly interactive. So we are looking for your questions, your comments that you can leave in the chat below. I will look at them and as a moderator, I will make sure that they're brought to the speaker's attention. So if I can say this is also a note for the speakers, do not worry about missing comments that are pasted in the chat box because I will duly note them and bring them back to you as we discuss. So I was saying interactive because this debate is also based on a dialogue format. We will have a conversation with the speakers through several questions that I will pose and I will also encourage the audience to comment on. I think now it's time to jump into the discussion, into, into the topic itself. And I think there is one key question we have to begin with when speaking with digital tools. Namely, what are the digital tools that you use for teaching and training? If Katarina, you agree, I would ask Jaime to go first and you second, and then we can, we can swap for the second question. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, I mean, I think that this, this topic is fascinating no? because everybody is in, in this space is thinking about how we can integrate technology, right, and how we can integrate digital tools to ensure that the learning is improved. No? So in, I'm the, the vice dean of the School of Global and Public Affairs at IE University, and, and we are trying to innovate a bit and trying to test uh, different approaches. But the first thing that I should say is that, I mean, there are plenty of opportunities to, to integrate digital tools, but it's, it's very important also to, to integrate the, them in a very smart way, you know, thinking about also the, the implications, not only for the students, but also for the professors that are supporting that uh, learning. No. So the the first set of things that we are uh, doing is we are uh, exploring and implementing several blended formats. And when I say blended, I I I, I mean a mix of face to face with online uh, formats. Uh, because at the end of the day, we have both a physical and a digital identity. No. So one of the key uh, lessons that I will highlight is that uh, we should focus on both dimensions, no? And sometimes we think that we can focus in one, only one, and the reality is not uh, just physical or just digital, no? So we tend to think that uh, blended formats are much more successful uh, nowadays. In, in, in our case, we started with the blended methodology, uh, methodology a long time ago, so, I mean, in, in the previous century, I would say. 
so when the internet was uh, very young, I would say, uh, and it has been a gradual process of integration. No? So for instance, now we have our our online MBA um, are very high in the in the rankings. So for instance, the we have according to the QS that is one of the uh, if not the the most important ranking the the global online MBA that we have is the first one in the in the world and according to Financial Times is, is the second one in the world. I mean according to other rankings it might be the third or the tenth. No, but um, the idea is that uh, I mean it takes time to refine the methodologies and also to ensure that you have the right professors using the right tools. You no, know? because sometimes we think that. Also, the, I mean, it's not only the perspective of the student, which is different, but also how the professor is trained eh, to use those tools, right? And when you are working about online tools, it's, it's important to have a, a, a nice um, display, but also something that is um, helpful for the professor, right? Um, also, it's important, I mean, a part of the development blended methodology, I would like to highlight also how we are using technology inside and outside. The, the classroom. No? So, um, for instance, we are using a lot uh, educational apps, right? Also to incorporate a bit the, the concept of gamification in the in the learning process. Um, also, in some cases, for instance, we are using fac uh, facial recognition, right, to identify the state of the student. So, and we are using. Uh, that technology both in the physical classroom and also in the digital classroom, right? So uh, for instance, uh, in, in a couple of minutes, we can show you a video of our wow room that is, well, you will see in the video, but you will see that in a, in a digital space, you can see the, you can recognize the, the expressions of the students and then you can see if they are interested or if they are bored or if they are laughing or if they are um, angry. Right, so that's very helpful also to in, increase the quality of the teaching and the learning process, right? But as I said before, I mean, technology, I mean, should be handled carefully, right? So for instance, if you have that technology and then you have a, like different colors with the different faces and you can see that everybody's bored, I mean, for the professor sometimes, I mean, it doesn't have the right training, it's not easy to to handle that. No? So. I mean, there, there is always a human side uh, next to the technological side of, of changes. Um, also, we are using a lot of digital simulations and, and cases no, that are more interactive. No? So for instance, in, instead of having the typical Harvard case, uh, um, I mean, we have cases that are done uh, online and then you can play around time and around information. And then you can have like, for instance, like, um, uh, I mean, you have part of the information, but then suddenly you have a message and says, hey, no, this is changing. And now the, the CEO is calling you and it's giving you this information. And then you have a pop-up with a video and then you have to enter information and you have a simulation and you have to say, hey, how do you organize these activities? And then based on that, there is a system or a, a computer system that is automatized that gives you the results. And then based on that, you get the next information. It's much more fun, I would say and also gives you a new perspective of, of simulations. No? So it's a, a mix between cases and, and simulation. Um, we are exploring a virtual reality as well, but it's still, I would say, in the, the testing um, process. Because for instance, we have already some, some scenarios of virtual reality in which you have to, um, to give you elevator pitch, right? or in which you have to convince a panel or something, or you have a job interview, or you have, I don't know, like you are in the middle of, of a crisis and then you have to move around, right? Or you are in a, in, a, in a space of operations and then you have to decide if you do this or do that, but it's not yet ready uh, for implementation because, um, I mean, it's, it has a lot of potential, but we need a bit more of time, right? But I think that in the future there will be more things like that. Um, and then finally, I would like to highlight the, the what we call the HIOPS, that are the high impact online programs. That is our version of a advanced a MOOCs, no? Because there is a lot of controversy about uh, MOOCs. So 
our approaches instead of MOOCs. I mean, we have a few MOOCs, but uh, in addition to that, we think that a, a blended MOOC in which you have a, a also interaction with your peers, interaction with your professor, and a bit more advanced uh, tools uh, is more helpful. No? So I, I can talk about that a bit later, no? but it's, it's a mix of, of online and other things that we, we are now using. But I mean, I don't know if Arvin is, is around, if he could display the, the video about the war room, because I think that, it's, I mean, a, a video sometimes is, uh, conveys a message in, in a much smarter and faster way. So should I do anything to okay. This is what business schools look like now. Students sitting in a classroom waiting for the professor. In a few years, it will look like this. The future has already arrived at the world's most advanced centers of learning. IE has just presented its WOW Room, the classroom of the future, which revolutionizes the learning process through artificial intelligence, simulations, big data, robots, and holograms. The WOW Room is the next step in the technology immersion here at IE. Over the last 15 years, we have invested more than 25 million euros in technology innovation. Students from over 150 countries will be educated using the WOW Room, immersed in technology. Through video conferences, simulations, and big data, students will learn to manage corporate crises, design production processes, or resolve diplomatic conflicts. The WOW Room software also recognizes the expressions on students' faces, gauges their level of attention, and registers their level of participation. The WOW Room has 48 screens that make up a digital tapestry covering 45 square meters, as well as cameras, robots, and holographic projectors. Just in the coming year, over a thousand students will take part in a class in the WOW Room. The heavily customized technology which we put in place here allows the faculty to very easily engage with the students and collaborate with them. IE launched its first e-learning unit in 2002. Since then, over 3,000 students take part each year in online learning sessions. IE's online MBAs have been ranked number one in the world by the Financial Times and The Economist for three consecutive years. Okay, thank you, Arvin. Thank you for Well, thank you very much. I mean, the, the war room is quite cool. I mean, because you can, you can see things and you can, you can organize the faces, they can vote, and then you can say, okay, those ones that vote yes are on the, this side. And then you can pack them, and then, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I would say that it, it was a big investment, but the good thing is that it's already uh, ready, or, I mean, we are using that very, very successfully. And once you have the technology, I mean, using the technology is, is cheap. You know, it's, it's just a matter of investing a bit of money at the beginning, and then, uh, we're finding that. Media now understand where it gets its name from. <laughs> the one room. It's quite impressive. Uh, I would pass now uh, to Katerina to answer the question. Then maybe we can see if there are any reactions on the in the chat. Otherwise, I have a couple of questions on the, on these fascinating tools. Katerina, over to you. Thank you, Mar uh, Marco. Uh, yeah, I also already have some very very. Uh, interesting questions in my head and I can see a lot of overlap but also a lot of difference to uh, what Jaime presented. Um, Arvin, if you can put up uh, the presentation I prepared uh, while, I, while I start. So we're talking about digital tools and I will focus on the digital tool that we use the most at Diplo, which is online courses. And we started this in 1994. And it evolved, and in its present form, we're doing this for more than 15 years now. We developed our own uh, learning management system. And we've been interacting and training diplomats and officials from more than 208 countries and territories. And altogether, by now, we've built a community of more than 5,000 people. The online courses are not MOOCs, and I think that's very important to stress. So we're talking about very small-scale online courses with a maximum of 25 people. The courses run for eight to ten weeks. Most of them do. Uh, they are highly collaborative and highly interactive. So in a sense, they're the complete opposite of a MOOC. They're kind of anti-MOOC. The courses can be taken individually uh, on topics uh, related to diplomacy, like diplomatic theory and practice, multilateral diplomacy, uh, these kind of topics. But also we're touching on topics related to 
digital policy and digital diplomacy. Um, are we, our most recent courses on artificial intelligence. So we're trying to do two things. We're trying to offer courses that develop quite a good and basic understanding of key diplomatic issues, such as negotiation skills, such as the history of diplomacy, and then courses that touch on new and recent topics that diplomats need to be aware of. And the courses can be taken individually or as part of a master in uh, contemporary diplomacy or master's degree in contemporary diplomacy with internet governance uh, specialization or as an advanced diploma in internet governance. So what I would like to do, and this is uh, our alumni map, so you can see those 5,000 people, more than 5,000 people are spread all across the world, and there's a focus for us on developing countries. And we really, uh, are really active in kind of keeping this community together and keeping this community engaged. So let me take you inside one of our courses. So I said we are developed our own LMS, and one of the key components of each course in terms of interaction, in terms of the most hours spent in the course, is the discussion of a lecture text. So this is also not very video-based or uh, fancy in that sense. It's very, it's back to basics. So our lecturers will write a text for each week that focuses on a key issue for the course in this week. What then happens, participants are asked to go through that text and highlight key elements in the text. So for example, they encounter a word that they don't know and want to ask a question about this. Or they encounter a concept that they want to discuss and go deeper into it, so they highlight it. By highlighting, they open a chat window and they can write a comment or a question. For me, as the person teaching the course, I can see all these questions, all these comments, and I react to them. So I answer the question, or I respond to the comment, or I, I try to further the discussion. And what you can see here on the screen is basically uh, the discussion tree that results from that. So participants, one participant will highlight one word or one sentence, and from there we develop a whole discussion on the topic. And this kind of highly interactive, highly collaborative way of building knowledge uh, is the key to our approach. And as you can see, it's quite uh, technologically, it's quite uh, old school, so to speak. And there's a very specific reason for this, which has to do with our core audience. But I will get to this um, at a later stage. What I would emphasize is that this kind of low-tech approach asks a lot of the people in the class. So our participants are kept very busy each week. But it also asks a lot about, uh, from the people moderating and teaching. And what we do is we basically try to do two things in this discussion. We're trying to question participants' observations, their examples. We're trying to weave different topics together to kind of create um, a further discussion, to create like a very tightly knitted discussion. And we're summarizing. So we're summarizing what participants have been saying to then further the discussion. And this is kind of this very collaborative, very interactive way of learning on this kind of low technological scale. And because Marco asked us to just introduce the uh, technology we're using and the digital tools we're using, I'm going to stop here and then see what other questions and what other um, discussions from the discussion are, are going to come up later. So over to you, Marco. Thank you, Katarina, for also keeping your, uh, your presentation brief. We had quite a few reactions, on the, especially on the WOW room. That was to be expected, to be honest. I think I will proceed as follow. Me, I, I have to ask you one question, and you shared a brief presentation on that. And then I will scoop the questions related to that specific topic, and then we go, we go on. And then we see how the dynamic uh, develops. I mean, we don't have an algorithm or a technology that inside the Adobe room can allow us to detect whether our audience is passive or not, or is falling asleep. But I consider on the number of the comments, we have quite a quite an attentive audience today. And going back to the questions to the WOW room, there is the first one from, uh, from Petru. He's, uh, he's asking how, if, if you, uh, Jaime, if you can share how more or less cheap the WOW room uh, was, is, is interested in that. And there are a couple of questions on the monitoring of students' attention. One is from Nagisa, and I will attach also a question from my hand to that, as it's quite, quite similar since I was also a student until two years ago, I recently graduated. So uh, especially teaching for me was always an experience that was highly based on human interaction. So to see how that human interaction passes and is conveyed through a digital tool is, is very interesting. 
she's asking whether how you monitor the level of participation is it just a matter of you just uh, look more traditionally how people engage in the class do they ask many questions do they do not ask or do you also monitor to a let's say micro expression level so how granular how specific is the uh, attention monitoring and another one from Ginger and complementary to this whether there has been a study or a paper or something more consistent on um, on uh, students' reactions to new approaches. Uh, I think she mentioned like that. Yes, have you have you uh, had any studies that show any results whether this type of simulating an in situ class just online uh, has any effect on on participation? Is it a does it foster participation? Does it foster attention? Has there been a study on this or not? And I think that uh, these are all the questions that have emerged. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, well, the first question about the, the cost, right, of using this kind of technology. I mean, if, I mean it's, it's important to separate the investment cost, the marginal cost of use. No? So when you think about the marginal cost of use, you, you should think about, I mean, the cost of, of having a big room, uh, like a very, very big room uh, that uses a lot of electricity and that uses a... Uh, in a significant amount of band uh, uh, of internet bandwidth, no? uh, because you need 33 people. I mean, we have capped the number of students to 33 because of pedagogical reasons. No, because we think that the, I mean, teaching in an online setting, even if it is with the wall room, is not easy. It's much easier to teach in a face-to-face. A physical classroom, right? So if you want people to really engage, you have to limit the number of students to 33, right? According to different studies that we have done and also in collaboration with, with other experts. In the in a classroom, we can reach maximum 40 something or even 50 in some cases, but uh, we are not having like big classrooms as, I don't know, like when I study at Harvard University, for instance, we have classroom of 100 people. Uh, in my school and even in larger, in larger rooms in, in other schools. But for us, I mean, keeping a small number of people is important. So we have designed the system to, to have a maximum of 33 students. But still, if you want them to have a very good connection, um, then you, have, you need to have a special arrangement with the IT company to ensure that you have that. So that's the, the only component that is a bit more expensive. But having a normal, a digital uh, session or a, a digital session in a in a war room. I mean, the, I don't remember exactly the, the extra cost of doing that, but maybe it's, I don't know, like I don't know, like two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars, uh, and then you distribute that. So it might be around two hundred dollars or something like that. So you have thirty-three people. I mean, you distribute that and. Is like I don't know seven dollars per person in addition for that advanced experience, right? When you look at an ad, a degree, I mean that is a very small marginal cost. It's more expensive to have the right person at the right time teaching the right audience. No, so all the efforts that that you need to invest to ensure that you have the right faculty, that you also have the right talent in the classroom, and that also everything is is in, is in order is much more expensive. That using that specific technology. Um, uh, then about how you monitor part, uh, participation. Um, I mean, there are different kind of analytics. Right? You see how people are questioning, if the questions are relevant or not. Uh, also, um, you have also an analysis of the expressions of the people. One of the lessons that we have learned during the implementation of this um, tool is that um, many professors are not able to handle too much information when they are teaching, right? Especially if they are coming from a traditional setting, they, I mean, the war room facilitates part of the process, but if you give simultaneously a lot of info and inputs about, hey, you know that you are losing the class, or you are... Uh, uh, this was, this joke was not fun at all, or uh, this kind of information that the artificial intelligence uh, system can can give you. I mean, sometimes distract the professor. So we 
right now with most of the professors we tend to analyze that information and give a report after the after the class and then you can see uh, in, with different uh, statistics how the engagement went up and down and they can uh, analyze the classroom and the, and the session that they prepare and they can see hey you know indeed when i gave this example the engagement went down the interest and and here on the other hand they were like raising hands a lot right so that helps you exposed because during this, the session, sometimes it's, it's too much. No? So, I mean, there are some professors that are able to handle that, but I would say that the majority, I mean, prefer to have information afterwards. But it's very helpful to increase the quality of the session because sometimes you, you have several small groups because you want to divide the classroom in, 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 in different groups to maximize the, the learning and the, and, and the satisfaction with the experience. So then you can test and you can say, hey, with this particular audience, this worked very well and I have this, this data. Um, and then you adjust your, your session. Then it's also important to measure the learning process because one of the key issues here is that sometimes we, we are not very good to measure our perception of learning, right? So how, the things that are explained through different formats are really learned and applied later. So we have a lot of evaluations before, during, after, and much after the, the sessions to, to check if it has worked or not, right? And it depends also on the audience, of the topic, of the discipline, but that's part of the, of the system. So all those things that are around technology are sometimes more important than the technology itself. Right. So, and those, but you learn those things when you are using the, the technology. Um, about the studies of reaction to the new approach, uh, I will say that in general, there are, uh, I mean, the new technologies, I mean, depending on the culture, because, I mean, we are talking about, uh, I mean, at IE, we have people from, I mean, students from 160 countries. So, uh, and I would say that around 90 or 90 something percent of our students are not from Spain, although we are based in Spain. So depending on how you are familiar with these technologies, I mean, the idea is that you should be able to use the technology without feeling that you are using a new technology, right? So and the more familiar is the setting, the, the, the better. Uh, but for instance, studying different reactions, we also see that, for instance, that we have to put a camera not only, I mean, that a camera following the professor, because for instance, if you are in a, in a, in front of many, 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 many screens, right? And then you see that there is a student that is asking from this side, but then when you are addressing this person, the camera is looking at you and then you lose the less of the, uh, the, the rest of the audience. Right, so with those studies, we realized that hey, you know, the, the camera should also move with the expression of the of the of the of the I mean, with the movement of the professor and have different cameras that are moving and connecting and identifying the movement of, of of the professor. So it's quite cool, but it took a bit of time to to uh, to analyze all the all the reactions to the different students to to the new technologies. I cannot hear you. No? I cannot. Not better. Okay. I was just thanking you for yeah, yeah. replying to the quick uh, reactions in the chat. I think it's best if we move on to the second and third question, which I would group, and then uh, bring up what is coming uh, up now later in the, towards the end during the general Q&A. As I was saying, I would like to group up um, the second and the third question, because I think some of the elements came up already during the Jaime's answers, which are, if you could tell us a little bit more about the advantages and the challenges that encountered so far and what are the best practices that others can learn from. So positive side from one, from one hand and negative from, uh, from the other. I would give the floor, I think, first to Katarina because uh, 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 before was the opposite. And I think some of the elements, Jaime mentioned them already. So Katarina, please. It was a pleasure listening to Jaime. And what I notice, it's super interesting how technology, so AI, facial recognition, is used to kind of look how people are doing in the class, to kind of monitoring them. We're doing something, or to kind of get the key information to tailor the course, kind of make sure they're not lost, to make sure they're not dropping off. And obviously when we talk about 
things online, online training, online teaching, this is one of the key concerns, namely completion rates. We've all seen that massive open online courses have very, very low completion rates. In our courses, that's also a question we are facing, and we have a system where we have at least two people on each course, one person focusing on the content and one person focusing on making sure that people stay on top of their workload. So each week there are specific tasks participants uh, need to fulfill, and we're kind of really closely checking, are they, are they doing what they're supposed to do? Are they on track? Are they making their comments? So this is kind of from the on the side, making sure that the, the quantity is there, that people keep engaged and keep engaged continuously over time, over each week of these eight or ten weeks that the online class is going on. And then from the kind of lecturing side, we, we kind of can see when, just based on these text comments, we can see when people start to be, let's say, less engaged. And we can probe them a bit and provoke them a bit and make sure the comments are coming and make sure the discussion is kind of reigniting. So I think that's a key issue we need to address when we talk about online training, online learning, digital tools. And it's really interesting to see that we can address them from kind of very different uh, perspectives. The other point, and that's kind of a larger point I wanted to make, is that when we talk about these kind of tools and training and teaching online, there are two main approaches, which is synchronous and asynchronous. So synchronous meaning everyone is together at the same time. So, for example, what Jaime is doing with the VAR room is everyone is together at the same time having a conversation. We have part of that in, in our courses as well. But for us, because we're dealing with people who are geographically extremely dispersed in the same course, most of our activities are asynchronous. So that means participants can do them when it kind of suits them, which helps them combine it with busy jobs which also helps us combine very different uh, time zones, which means that I might have made a comment in the evening, and then I'm waking up the next morning to, to a whole new, whole new discussion that already has taken place while I was sleeping, which uh, really helps participants who are geographically dispersed and really helps keep the conversation going. Um, Arvin, if you can bring up the, uh, the other slide, then I can, can say a little bit more about that. In terms of uh, also in terms of general um, approaches, because what I wanted to point out is that obviously digital tools are not a panacea, so it's not it's not a magic bullet, and I think we're, we're all aware of that. So they have to be um, tailored very very carefully. So one larger reflection I wanted to bring into the discussion is that online training digital tools are sometimes viewed as um, a silver bullet in terms of. Um, responding to a world that's accelerating. So now we can deliver training to people just in time, just as they need it, which is true, which we're also doing by having targeted and tailored courses. But I think there is something else we shouldn't forget when it comes to learning and training, which is we should protect the spaces for, ref for broader reflection that we can create in, when we offer learning and training. And both of them kind of have to go together, so it's kind of just in time delivering extremely timely, extremely tailored information to participants who need it, for example, to go into a negotiation e-commerce and be prepared really well. But at the same time, we need to offer, I think, broader reflections, in our case, on the history of diplomacy, on Philip de Comin and Cardinal Richelieu and all these things, to kind of help people zoom out from their day-to-day -day activities and create this kind of broader picture and this space for broader reflections. What I also wanted to talk about is how do we decide what the right tool is? And I think one way of doing that is by starting from learning objectives. So what are we trying to achieve? Is this about just acquiring and remembering information? Is this about, second, developing analytical skills? Or third, is this about problem-solving skills? And very much depending on what you need, a different approach is, uh, is called for, so for example, acquiring and remembering information, a kind of massive open online course style course is, is quite appropriate. But when we talk about analytical skills and problem solving skills, we need different kinds of tools. And I think what both Jaime and I presented really falls more in this analytical skills, problem solving skills. And I think there's the, it's a good point for kind of thinking about what are we trying to achieve and how, and how are we doing this? Let me also say a little bit about the challenges encountered, because that was also the question, part of the question that Marco um, 
Uh, I think the first challenge is to not think that there is um, a silver bullet to technology. That's, I think, the most important point. Um, for us, in, in our context, focusing on diplomats in developing countries, there is a question around the digital divide in the sense that what can we do to bridge the digital divide? What can we do to connect the people who would otherwise be left out of some of those um, approaches, some of those offerings when it comes to online training? And that's why, for example, we decided to have this very um, low-tech, very downscaled approach, which is mostly asynchronous and which is mostly working with text because for us that's one of the key things to kind of really include these people who might otherwise be excluded due to simple things such as access to internet, connection, uh, broadband, bandwidth, all, all these kind of questions. So again, it comes back to the question of what are we trying to achieve and how are we selecting the tools uh, to achieve that. And again, I think this debate is brilliant because it really highlights those two different sides to the same coin. Let me stop there. Uh, just one last point. On the slide you see uh, points on collaborative learning and this is really at the core of our approach, kind of the idea that everyone in our course has something to contribute and we're bringing all of that together and then constructing knowledge together. So that's the kind of idea behind uh, the kind of methods and pedagogy, pedagogy, pedagogy and tools that uh, we decided on. But let me stop here because there's already a lot. And I think uh, Jaime has a lot to add to this. And I can see there's so many questions and points in the discussion. So let me stop here. Over to you, Marco. Karina, I'll pass the floor immediately to Jaime for challenges and opportunities in addition to those that he has already mentioned. And then I'll, uh, I'll scoop the questions that have been typed in the chat for, for you. Jaime, please. OK, thank you very much, Marco. So I think that what Kat mentioned is, is, is critical, no? that is the, how we use the right tool or approach according to the audience and to the objective. No? And that's, that's the key issue when we think about pros and cons of, of this kind of methodology. And I would say that, I mean, if we think about how we choose the right tool, I mean, we can think about six different dimensions, no? that, uh, for instance, the, the access. No? When we are thinking about reaching people that are anywhere and that might have different time zones, right? Uh, I mean, access is, is an issue, no? And what can mention about combining synchronous and asynchronous uh, kind of activities that, that helps to try to, to, to give access to, to everybody to, uh, and to, to that learning opportunity. Also, the scalability is important, no? How we are able to reach, I mean, in some cases we want very, a small groups. In some cases, we want to reach thousands of people. So depending on that, I mean, uh, I mean, one tool or the other might be more helpful. Uh, affordability uh, is also important. Our affordability, thinking about what is the marginal cost of using this kind of, of tool. Uh, but that's also a criter, uh, a factor that we need to take into account. Then the engagement. I mean, at the, at the engagement, sometimes we, we talk about learning at adherence, not that it's like, okay, uh, sometimes it's measured with the completion rate, right? But I mean, thinking about uh, how people are engaged and really keeping the pace of, of the learning process and the teaching. Then also the evaluation of, of, of learning and learning, thinking about the knowledge that is acquired, but also the skills that are developed. Uh, another factor is, is the action that is coming after the learning. That is not just the knowledge and the, and the skills, but also how this program has helped you to then be proactive, to be empowered, and then take action after that using that knowledge. I mean, that's also a very important factor to choose, I mean, the, the kind of approach and tool. And also, um, I mean, seeing the evaluation of the, of the, of the students and, and also the value that they give to the certification, no? Because sometimes, I mean, that's part of the of the value proposition, no? That you have something that is very hard to get because it's very intense and it's very well recognized because everybody knows that if you went through that process, I mean, you are like super top because you have learned many things and you are very recognized. I mean, also that's sometimes something that should be considered when we choose the kind of 
of tool or approach when we are thinking about big programs or small programs or very uh, very difficult to get into programs. Um, but those are some of the factors. Also, to comp I mean, to to analyze the pros and cons. Coming back to the Marcos question, no, about like that it was about the advantages of, of these tools. No, it's, it's good to compare these tools with the traditional or uh, MOOCs, no, that are already traditional, no, in some way, no, and uh, because Kat also referred to that, no, and 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 the fact is that um, there are, I mean, the reality is that there is very high demand for learning, right? But there is always an overwhelming supply of information, right? So how you match the demand for learning with plenty of information that is available on digital platforms, right? And, and also there is sometimes a, a kind of strange perception of what you are learning or not, because sometimes you see a video that is very exciting and then you feel that you are learning, but then uh, 10 minutes later you are doing something else and you for, forget about that video, right? So. Uh, I mean, there are many, many neuro neurological studies about how you use the right technique to to ensure learning. And sometimes repetition is one of the of the key of key points. Or some, or also how you build a community of learning, right? That reminds you some of the of the points. And then how you also practice those tools. No, so those things should be integrated. And in the MOOCs, you many times you don't have that. I mean, you. I mean, MOOCs are, are criticized many times because of the low completion rate, right? So for instance, the Financial Times published a study um, of the MIT uh, that analyzed uh, MOOCs from MIT and Harvard and say that less than 3% of, um, of the MOOCs that are produced by them, right? That are supposed to be the ones that are very well recognized. Uh, despite the fact that they are well recognized, less than 3% of them were uh, completed by the students, right? Or less than 3% of the students completed the, the MOOCs. Uh, in our case, for instance, the few MOOCs that we did at I University, I mean, our completion rate was around 12 to 15%. That is much better, but it's still, it's very low, right? Um, and we included a lot of simulations to increase that, and, and that's why it's, it's a bit higher, no? But but the point is that we, we don't have to, or we shouldn't, judge MOOCs as we judge other learning methodologies because it's, 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 it's so different. Because for instance, you don't charge or you don't judge um, uh, the New York Times according to how many people read all the newspaper every day from the beginning to the end, right? Uh, you just try to assess if it's making any impact. Right, so with the MOOCs, it's a kind of similar case. Now, now we have discovered that it's like you have a podcast or you have a Netflix documentary, right? That is not about if you finish the documentary; it's about the impact that you are generating, right? Um, but having said that, I mean, I think that there, there are like two different animals: the MOOCs and the advanced digital uh, courses or tools, right? Uh, when we think about the blended formats that, that we are promoting or the, or the high ups that are the high impact online programs, uh, the good thing is that they combine the best thing of the MOOCs, but also we compensate the not so good things. No? That's so for instance, we give flexibility because we combine synchronized and unsynchronized sessions. So depending on where you are, you join one or the other or both and you coordinate that. And so it's self-paced online. Uh, learning, no, in most of the, most of the time, and that's critical for for the world now. No, that you cannot move to one place; you have to to be flexible with that. Also, I mean, it's really important the the relevance of the of the content. No, so a continuous effort to update the content uh, and based on 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 the evolution of the of the discipline and also in the evaluations that you are receiving. So all the the analytics of the discipline. Of the market and the and the students is, is critical. Then sometimes I mean one thing that is, is is critical for engagement is how you are building a community, right? And how you are building a space for networking, right? Because people are learning from others. I mean, I remember when I was at the university, I don't remember my professors. I remember my colleagues, right? And when I have a doubt, I don't ask a, a former professor. I, I I I ask a former colleague, right? So most of the learning is coming from others. So if you don't have 
a digital space in which you learn from others, you are missing 90% of the learning, right? And also you want to meet people that share your sense of belonging or your interest, right? You want to study about, I don't know, uh, diplomacy in conflict area, right? You also want to have friends that are facing similar situations, right? So if you don't create a digital space in which you can really interact with others, and, and sometimes, I mean, chatting is, is okay, but sometimes you need to put a face or give a hug or whatever is acceptable, acceptable from your cultural perspective, you know? Uh, but you need also those spaces that are physical or that are close to be physical, right? So uh, the guidance of professors, I mean, when you have an automatic system that is giving you information, right? And there is not a person, a human behind that, I mean, uh, you, I mean, there is a high risk of getting lost and focusing on what is taught, not what is learned, right? And it's very difficult what a person is trying to teach and what a person is learning, right? And with a with a computer or a system that is automatic, I mean, it's really difficult to really ensure that the person is learning and acquiring that knowledge. Um, then also, I mean, the design should be like, uh, should be un understood very carefully, you know, because we have to think about, okay, what are the formats? What is what is the timing, no? The, I mean, that if if people tend to say that from a neurological perspective, I mean, you can keep the attention uh, continuously for 10 to 18 minutes, right? It doesn't make sense that you keep responding a question for more than that or that, and then you, you try to put a video or to have a simulation. I mean, you try to keep it interesting. Uh, to maintain people engaged, no? so all the programs are designed also thinking in, on, on those studies. Let me quickly, right? um, quickly pick up on that element because we had a couple of questions on that specific uh, item from the audience. Uh, Katerina has said that, uh, let's say, ex ante, how do we assess whether a tool is right, does it fit the purpose of what we want to deliver, but many questions were asking exposed, how, do we, how can we assess whether a tool, a digital tool, it's been successful in delivering what we have done. So uh, Jaime, you already managed. Uh, you, you already mentioned a impact-oriented kind of assessment to see whether it has had a specific impact or not. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether you have a little more thoughts on that uh, and on the practical side. How do you assess the impact of a digital tool, especially compared to others? I know that you said it's difficult methodologically to compare difficult to different tools because they may also serve different purposes. And passing also the question to, to Katarina. Katarina, how do, in your opinion, how can we assess the impact of, uh, how can we say whether a tool has been successful or not? Should we base it on the impact? Do we base it on some, something else? Uh, start. May I ask? May um, I respond? I mean, ju just a couple of things were to... basically, uh, Hannah made a really important point. Uh, Besides this example of watching a video online or reading a newspaper, you don't have to read it front to cover to, to have an effect. The key thing is what, what stays with you. And even if you feel very motivated and hyped and excited in the moment, it might not mean that it has uh, any, any long-term effect. Measuring impact is difficult, and especially when it comes to digital tools. That, that's, that's kind of a given. But I think also in our context, it's even harder because our courses, for example, have a, a final assignment, so which usually kind of gives a very broad picture of the course and allows students to write a lot of participants to write a longer essay and really reflect on what has been going on in the course and usually in relation to their own practice and what they are experiencing on the ground. So that's that's kind of a first step to kind of really make sure there is at the end of the course there's a broader reflection on the topics in the course, but always in relation to the specific uh, experience and the practice of participants in, in the course. But when we talk about impact, we usually talk about something much longer term. And there it gets really, uh, really difficult because we, when we look at uh, diplomacy, we're talking about the, about the practice that it's, it's hard to measure. How do you measure the success of a diplomat? So in the sense that, for example, you might be a really good negotiator, but given the circumstances, you just weren't successful, right? So we, we can look at career tracks, and because we have this community of practitioners, we tend to follow them and we tend to see them over and over again. So we can see how people kind of shape their, their careers in the long term. 
But I, I feel like any of these measures doesn't quite get to, get to the heart of it. So I think it is difficult. I think the best thing is to do to have something right after the course to kind of ask participants to have a reflection on what's happened in the course and how they experienced it and how they think they can carry it into practice. And then something longer term. But having said that, I think that goes for all kinds of teaching situations and the kind of difficulty of really getting an impact also goes for all kinds of teaching situations. Okay. Uh, and in our case, I mean, we have done many tests, especially in those programs that are offering different formats. No? Because, for instance, we have a I mean, I'm thinking especially in MBAs. No, we I mean within our university, the business school is the, like the largest and oldest school, uh, so they have just a different programs uh, in face-to-face -face format, online program, and blended uh, format. No, so then you can see the difference. I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult to is, uh, isolate isolate factors because maybe the person that is coming through. A traditional face-to-face -face channel is very different to a person that is coming through an online channel, but we try to play around also to have some kind of control groups. No? You have the control group, the treatment group, and then you, you measure the differences. Um, our experience is that, in general, I mean, we, we don't have so many pure online programs anymore because we think that that component of, of uh, meeting your colleagues and meeting some professors it's important, so we have a face-to-face -face or blended, in which you have at least two kind of meetings like that could take like five to seven days or even two weeks, uh, in which you interact with you, you peers and, and you have fun and then you put faces and so on. Uh, the, the, the challenge of that is that it, it increases the, the cost, no? because people have to go there. Right, and at least a couple of times, and they need to go to the place that you decide. I mean, it could be Spain, or it could be, I don't know, uh, uh, to I don't know Silicon Valley, or it could be uh, to Shenzhen uh, in China, or it could be wherever you think. Right. So many times we try to have in different continents the the face to face um, uh, weeks. Um, the, on the other hand, the good thing is that also you can engage professors that are not physically in the same place uh, in that university is. The only issue is that then you cannot use the war room because they only we have only the war room here, uh, but we have the war room in a pocket. No, that is kind of a display that you can put like two, three screens or even just one screen and you use the same uh, software. No, that with artificial intelligence and so on. So the, the professor could be at Harvard University or could be in Yale. In the Yale University, and then it can can use that technology in a different format. Um, then, when we comp when we think about executive programs and short executive programs, um, I mean we try uh, MOOCs and we try also high ops. And then, I mean actually high ops is is an evolution of the MOOCs because there were many things that were not working well in the in the MOOCs. So uh, we also integrated that interaction with the professor and with the peers in the MOOC system in a kind of uh, more like a um, practical way. No? So I would say that, I mean, comparing different methodologies, we have some lessons and now we are investing in the things that, that we think that are more successful. But I mean, probably at some point we'll have to, I mean, we are thinking about, for instance, we we're doing some MOOCs as micro programs that gives you access to a larger programs. No? So for instance, MIT is doing that, no? that has a MOOC, and then if you are in the top 1%, you have a scholarship to go to MIT and then study. And then you ensure that the person is really engaged, is super smart, is really doing amazing things, because it's a way not only to teach, and, but also to identify talent. And to say, hey, you know that, I mean, there were like, 20,000 people doing this, and we we have 20 people in this group of 20,000 that are amazing, right? So that's also something that we are exploring, no? how we can have programs and that are like very cheap, that are very easy to escalate, but that, that can help you today to identify that talent, because it's not only about um, 
I mean, what you are trying to uh, to teach that is about how you put in the same room, physical or, or digital room, the right people, right? So that's also something that we're exploring. Thank you to both Jaime and Katarina. We are a bit pressed on time, so I think I will just wrap up the discussion, which has been quite lively also in the Skype chat. Comments have, uh, have uh, flown. Uh, there were people more uh, in favor of the of the good sides of e-learning, were more people in favor of the, and more skeptical towards the challenging challenges, especially when it comes to using facial recognition to monitor students and this kind of aspect, aspect are the people more enthusiastic, especially there were a couple of comments in this regard when it comes from a under-researched a researched point of view and from developing countries, the potential that the tool uh, offers, especially for uh, for regional cooperation, are, are, are undeniable. And especially a couple of good remarks on how to measure the impact. I think we just had a comment from Hannah saying we have to be very careful, re reiterating what Katarina said, distinguishing between the effectiveness and the impact of learning and the effectiveness of the tool and how the two of, uh, of them are combined. As, as I was saying, we are a bit uh, short on time, so I think I'll, uh, I'll wrap up the discussion. I will thank uh, once again the speakers, Katarina and Jaime, for joining us today and discuss this very interesting topic. A couple of, um, of announcements before, before we close. As you know, the recording of the webinar will be made available together with the digest. And since this is our last recording of the year, the next one we will, will be in February. We will skip January because of the holidays. And uh, this thing, I wish to all the ones that have joined us a very, very happy holidays. And uh, thank you again to the speakers.